everyone. Thanks for stopping by and seeing what I'm up to. My name is Silky Feather, and you can call me Silky. We're going to continue with our growing marijuana box set here with the audiobook <clears throat> by Clyde Bank Alternative, narrated by Amy Baron Zolimsky and Kevin Colson. you know that not all are created equal. Different strains have different growing characteristics, different needs, and different qualities for the end user, be they medical or recreational. This chapter focuses on the information that new or beginning growers will need to get their first harvest. If you have the luxury of being able to select suitable grow room or outdoor grow area from a number of options, then congratulations. You'll have a lot more options when it comes to strain selection. The bulk of growers grow indoors, and as such have additional challenges when growing strains that are bred to be taller. Though these plants can be trained to be a better fit for the grower's space, it is much simpler to start with plants that have been bred to grow shorter and bushier. In many cases, these strains have been bred for their size characteristics without sacrificing yield. Genetic Engineering The media hype term GMO, or Genetically Modified Organism, has lent quite a bit of misunderstanding to the process of genetic modification. While the long-term effects of scientific procedures that tamper with the DNA of various food crops have not been fully studied, this is just one facet of genetic modification. Humanity has practiced selective breeding for thousands of years. The best example of highly successful and differentiated selective breeding is man's best friend. Think about the variety of domestic dogs that exist. Almost none of those breeds would have naturally come about. Through selective breeding, the species was shaped and culled in such a way that designer breeds, as well as dogs bred for herding or security, are commonplace. The same concept applies to plants. Modern grains differ from the increasingly popular ancient grains because thousands of years of cultivation have resulted in wheat, barley, and rye that are highly distinguishable from the natural makeup of their ancestors. Bred for disease resistance, increased yield, lower nutritive needs, and hardiness, these plants never would have naturally come about. Breeding through sexual reproduction combines genetic material from a set of parents, from dog, to cannabis plants, to orange trees. Tampering with a natural process is a form of genetic modification, but one that follows the template laid out by nature and produces more or less natural offspring. Due to the high profit incentive that cannabis offers, scientists, growers, and botanists alike have explored the cannabis genome and have bred a number of strains that are optimized for various characteristics. Today, with legalization on the horizon, that research is expanding and gaining steam to the extent that nearly all seeds purchased are the result of extensive genetic engineering by way of selective breeding. Seeds now that we have all of the supporting aspects of your growing operation squared away, we've come to the good part, the plants. No matter how large or small your operation, you will need seeds. A good source of seeds is a breeder that you know and trust, a resource that can be difficult to come across when just starting out. If personal contacts aren't an option, there are a number of reputable online dealers as well, although it is advised that you thoroughly research the legality of purchasing seeds online the legality of their transport and storage, and the consequences of violating federal, state, and local laws. Also, keep in mind that logging into a marijuana chat room and posting looking for weed seeds shouldn't fit into your security profile. Be cautious and casual, and remember that many potential sellers may be equally cautious. It is important to understand they don't know you, and they stand to lose just as much, if not more, if you turn out to have intentions other than what you state. In the end, your goal should be to establish a rapport with a reliable and trustworthy seller to keep you in the seeds, so to speak. Any successful business venture needs a stable supply chain. It is advisable, however, to use online forums and cannabis chat rooms where amateur and professional growers alike can swap stories, tips, and tricks. In a tightly knit community such as the cannabis growers, a bad breeder's reputation will precede him. The same goes for a successful and trustworthy breeder. 
People will be willing to review and provide references for a breeder and seller with a proven track record of integrity. It is common knowledge, as with many industries with varying legality, that the internet is rife with scams advertising discount seeds. Don't abandon online communities once you've found your source of seeds. Forums, message boards, and chat rooms can all be valuable resources as your operation grows. In some states, the sale of cannabis seeds is illegal and can be done over the counter at a physical shop. In that instance, don't worry about the process. Starting your marijuana crop will be as easy as a trip to the hardware store. Staff at such stores are invariably knowledgeable and helpful and can help you tailor your strain to your situation. Understanding what makes strains different. The wonderful world of growing cannabis is packed to the gills with different kinds of marijuana. There are literally hundreds of different strains, but to narrow our focus a little bit, we're going to look at which strains are best for beginners. Some online retailers will break their offerings into different categories to simplify the selection process. This can include categorizing strains by climate zone, height, flowering time, yield, and sativa or indica. Remember in the very beginning when we discussed the different types of cannabis, C. sativa and C. indica? That's going to come back into play here. Understanding if your strain is sativa or indica based is important as this will tell you some fundamental characteristics to expect from the growing cycle and final product. Please refer to table eight in the companion PDF document for the difference between sativa and indica cannabis. There is a third classification of hybrids or plants that have been bred to be a combination of both sativa and indica plants. Often these strains are bred with an intended effect in mind or a particular growing characteristic. Your seed dealer can tell you more about the particular characteristics of different hybrid strains. Auto flowering seeds. When shopping for seeds, in addition to the standard lots of seeds, you may see two additional categories, auto flowering and feminized seed lots. Auto flowering seeds are excellent for novice growers as they are easiest to care for. When growing auto flowering seeds, there is no need to remove the male plants or any need to change light cycles. Auto flowering cannabis plants are hybrids that incorporate the uncommon and little known cannabis ruderalis, a cannabis variant that grows wildly in the Caucasus Mountains, Mongolia and China. See ruderalis flowers automatically, no matter the change in light and spring up very quickly. It is also a very short plant that is a dwarf next to even C. indica. The downside to this small cannabis variant is that in its natural form, it produces low amounts of THC, giving it poor utility. When properly crossed with sativa or indica cannabis plants, however, the benefits of both types can be reaped and the result is an easy to care for, quick growing and frequently yielding cannabis plant. Many growers swear by auto flowering strains and they often present the best option for new growers. Some growers who started with auto flowering strains are still growing them today, never switching to pure indica or sativa strains. Growers agree that the quality of buds from auto flowering strains can be optimized to the point that many users can't tell the difference. Understandably, this type of strain is quickly gaining both popularity and scrutiny from the growing community. Feminized seeds. Feminized seeds have been bred to contain no male chromosomes, therefore ensuring that every crop will be only composed of female plants. This option is also a good choice for new growers, but keep in mind that these plants should not be used for breeding or breeding projects. The process that is used to feminize the plants comes from a number of self-pollinations and various other methods that destabilize the plant's DNA. Growers often report seeing a higher number of buds that display both male and female traits, hermaphroditic buds, with the offspring of feminized plants. Name that strain. Many seed dealers offer strains that they recommend for new growers with a variety of names. Once you have found a reputable seed dealer, work with her to find a strain that is a good fit for you and use the information in this chapter to help make your determination. Alternatively, if you know the name of a strain that you like, Look up its characteristics and determine if it is a good fit for your operation and your needs. A variety of websites and other outlets have extensive information regarding the individual effects that various strains have on the end user, as well as optimal growing conditions and other tips and tricks. The massive number of strains that exist and the new ones that are being added all of the time 
means that we can't include a comprehensive list here. Work with your breeder or seed dealer armed with the knowledge this book has given you to make the best decision, an informed one. Chapter 7. Growing and Caring for Your Cannabis This is it, the step-by-step -step guide to harvesting your first crop. If this doesn't turn out the way you were expecting, be patient and try again. Learning is a process, and becoming an experienced grower means that you need time to gain that experience. Remember, record everything. Keeping a journal or a grow log will ensure that you don't make the same mistakes twice, and that the right decisions are duplicated next time. Having a recipe for success will help others help you as well. If you seek help from more experienced growers, whether in person or through an online forum, keep your log handy to help them understand what you've already done and possibly where you may have gone right or done wrong. Growing plan. The following schedule and growing plan covers the whole process from seeds to mature flowering plants. Germination. The first stage of a plant's life is germination. For cannabis plants, germination can take up to three weeks and the seeds will require daily attention. The process of germination is the emergence of a root from the shell of the seed. In nature, the seeds drop and germinate on their own in exposed soil. But for a grower's purpose, it makes more sense to stimulate germination indoors. Scatter the seeds on a wet piece of paper towel and place them on a plate. Cover the seeds with another wet paper towel, then place another plate on top of the first. The paper towels should remain damp, check twice a day to ensure they are suitably moist. Once the shell is cracked and the new root is approximately an eighth of an inch long, your seeds can be transferred to a growing medium. Do not plant the young seeds any deeper than an eighth of an inch. Exercise extreme caution when transferring the germinating seeds. It is best to gently dump the entire damp paper towel into the growing medium, and not to touch or otherwise directly disturb the sprouting seeds. A quick note regarding your growing medium. There are a variety of commercially available growing mediums ranging from standard potting soil to cocoa fiber. Some growers use small trays of temporary pots to start the germinating seeds, then later transfer them to larger, more permanent homes. Others simply start germinating the seeds in their intended homes, whether in pots, trays, or outdoors. Experiment with which works best for your situation and operation. Once your seedlings have grown several leaves, it will be safe to transplant them into a rich potting soil mix. It is also at this stage that they will be hardy enough to take in fertilizer. It may be enticing to grow the largest plants you or anyone has ever seen, but before you start making calls to brag, keep concealment and security in mind. Many smaller strains have been optimized to produce a comparable yield, so there's no trade-off to growing smaller plants. Smaller plants will be easier to conceal, easier to transport, and easier to care for. Always use extreme caution when fertilizing your plants, especially when they are very young. Too much fertilizer can produce an effect opposite to your intent. Too much can kill young plants. When using chemical fertilizers, take care to read all of the directions for safe and proper use. Fertilize with care and remember that under-fertilization is better than over-fertilization. If your operation is small and you intend to remain more or less small, keep in mind that plants, like goldfish kept in small bowls, will only grow as large as their pots allow them to. Keeping your cannabis plants in smaller pots means that the plants will stay small, concealable, and portable. Perhaps you have heard of small recreational operations whose entire crops are grown and harvested from red solo cups. It's more than an anecdote. It's very possible, just don't expect record-breaking yields. Week one, vegetative. Your established seedlings are in the soil and ready to start growing. Remember not to shock them, young or otherwise, with sudden changes. This first week will be acclimating your plants to the intensity of the growing lights. Run them at 50%, either turn them to half strength or only use half as many lights. This is part of the vegetative growth stage. So remember blue spectrum rich light will give you the best results. For this example, Assume that 600 watt HID lights are being used. When watering for the first time, ensure that they are off to a good start by watering until excess water flows from the bottom of each pot. This will be more than enough water for a while, so wait to water them again. It is recommended to spray them daily to keep the humidity up. 
This will help reduce moisture evaporation from the soil as well. If you are using higher intensity lamps, make sure that they are far away from the young plants. About three feet is a good distance for plants this young. The light duration for this period is 18 hours on, six hours off. The planting density here is one plant per square foot. Week two, vegetative. During week two, turn on or up all of the lights and reduce their distance from the plants by half. This should bring them to 1.5 feet from the young cannabis plants. If there is any concern about excessive heat or the plants becoming too hot, then back the lights off a bit. If possible, water your plants from below by dipping them in water to train the roots to seek the bottom of the pot faster. Do not leave your pots in standing water. Water normally as needed. This will expand the root system quickly and ensure that your plants are getting the most out of their watering regimen. To train your plants to grow firm stems, set a fan to the lowest setting and point it at your crop. The plants should move only slightly under the breeze of the fan. As the stalks bend and move slightly, the plant will divert resources to strengthen its core. Thick, strong stems mean that your plants will be hardier. Hardy plants better survive transport, more effectively transport nutrients throughout their own systems, and have a higher tolerance to stressors like underwatering. Most importantly, thick stems prepare the plant for the weight of thick and heavy buds. During the second week of vegetative growth, continue the 18 hours on, 6 hours off light cycle. In many instances, the profit-motivated grower can switch to the 12 hours on, 12 hours off cycle to stimulate flowering after only two weeks. If you continue another week of vegetative growth, it won't hurt your plants. But in most cases, growers often make the switch after two weeks if their plants are strong and hardy enough. When starting out, it may be wise to go at least one more week before changing to the flowering light cycle, but that is up to you. Remember to record everything when determining what works best for you. Week one, flowering. Here, your lights should still remain at 100% capacity and you should make the shift to your red spectrum. Here is the place for your HPS lights if you have taken the plunge and purchased those. Your lights should remain about a foot and a half away from the plants if they are high intensity. Now you make the change from 18 hours on, 6 hours off, to 12 hours on, 12 hours off. This effectively tricks the plants into responding to what would normally be autumn light and day length. Because red spectrum light is effectively hotter, it is a good idea to aim your fan between the plants and the lights to diffuse the heat throughout the entire room and combat hot spots that could fry individual plants. Keep strong breezes off the plants. Keep in mind that although this begins the flowering process, you will not see signs of flowering for a few weeks yet. Week 2 Flowering Using the same lighting setup and light cycle, keep an eye on the tops of the plants and the edges of the leaves. The plants should be growing noticeably faster now, so monitor their growth to ensure they are kept at a safe distance, about a foot and a half, from HID lights. If the edges of the leaves begin to curl or brown, the lights need to be farther away or your fan needs to be turned up and repositioned. It is also a good idea to watch the base and stem to pinch out side shoots or other small plants that may be developing on your main plant. Non-productive parts of the plant drain resources and don't contribute to bud production. Week 3, Flowering Again, your lighting shouldn't have changed except for any adjustments to stop the plants from growing into them or too close. And the light cycle should still be 12 hours on, 12 hours off. The root system should protrude from the bottom of the pot and the signs of the first flowers should be visible. This is the last possible time when males and females can be commingled. If there are any males that remain with females in your crop, you risk your entire harvest. During this period, the plants consume the highest amount of water. Check moisture levels regularly and water as needed. If you are using a fertilizer, skip this week and rinse the soil. Week 4, Flowering At this point, Small, developing buds should be present all over the plants, and the plants should start to become fragrant. For those growers using fertilizer, switch to a bloom fertilizer during this week. Remember to make sure that as the plants grow, the lights are kept at a safe distance from the plants as they get taller. Throughout the week, the lighting cycle does not change. Week 5 Flowering At this point, your crop should slow its upward growth and the buds should develop more readily. Here, light is a key. 
But remember that the buds are even more sensitive than the leaves, so make sure that nothing gets cooked. If you have concerns about heat, a simple thermometer stuck into one of the pots can tell you specifically how much heat the plants are experiencing. Keep an eye out for signs of distress, disease, or insects. If any of your stems are red, this can also be an indicator of stress. Week 6, Flowering. At this point, the plants require the maximum amount of water and CO2, so check the moisture frequently and make sure that your plants have fresh air. This means keeping a ventilation fan running. Right now, your job as a grower is to make sure that your plants can do their thing in a stable and optimal environment. If you're using fertilizer, rinse at the end of this week. Week 7, Flowering. The buds that are present are gaining volume and there's a white material deposited on the small leaves near the buds. This is an indicator of high THC levels, so keep up the good work. Week 8 flowering. This is the time when the buds will become denser. If the bottom leaves of your plants are becoming discolored and dying, it's not nutrient deficiency. It's a natural part of the flowering process. So don't over fertilize thinking the plant is dying. Keep an eye out for mold or upper leaves that are yellowing or brown. If anything appears to be moldy or otherwise damaged, clip it immediately to prevent it from spreading. Week 9 Flowering Continue to keep an eye out for rot or insects. During this phase, it is normal for many of the leaves to become discolored, and the hairs on the buds should be turning brown. Once at least 80% of the hairs have turned brown, they are ready to harvest. If they are still using high amounts of water, then they can be left a while longer before harvesting. Please note that it is important not to fertilize your plants during the final stages of flowering. Additional fertilizer at this stage can reduce potency and can add unwanted bitter flavors to the final product. And there you have it. Remember to record everything about the process so it can be reliably replicated and so that you have material to bring to others if questions arise. And look back through this book frequently to keep all of the information in the forefront of your mind when growing. And that's where we pause today. We did two chapters because they were both kind of small. <clears throat> the last chapter was like a half an hour. Either way, I am thankful you stopped by. Hit that like and subscribe button today. More books to come and the ending of this box set. Be kind to one another. This is Silky Feather signing off. Bye-bye.